wing produces a pressure differential between its top and bottom surfaces as it moves through the air. As a result, the high pressure air from below the wing tries to move toward the low pressure area above the wing. The wing gets in the way and lift is produced. At the wing tips, however, the high pressure air from below the wing spills around to the top of the wing. As a result, a pair of wingtip vortices are produced, which trail behind the airplane as it flies. If a wing is producing lift, it is also producing wingtip vortices. The strength of an airplane's wingtip vortices depends on the amount of lift being produced by the wing. Vortex intensity varies with an airplane's weight, speed, wing design, and configuration. Wingtip vortices will be the strongest when the producing airplane is heavy, slow, and in a clean configuration, such as during takeoff. Wingtip vortices will sink at about 4 to 500 feet per minute, slowing their rate of descent over time. They tend to level off about 900 feet below the altitude at which they were produced, and then dissipate over time. If they are generated near the ground, they will usually stop descending within 200 feet of the ground and begin to move apart from each other until they dissipate. In this case, their lateral movement tends to be at a slow speed of only a few knots. An encounter with another airplane's wake can cause your airplane to roll uncontrollably. This lack of control can be very dangerous, especially near the ground when the pilot has the minimum time to recover from such an upset. At any altitude, it would be possible for wake turbulence to damage the airplane if it were encountered. And it can't be seen, so pilots must learn to visualize and avoid wake turbulence. Since wake turbulence sinks and dissipates, wake turbulence avoidance usually comes down to staying above the flight path of the generating airplane. If you were landing behind a larger airplane, staying above that airplane's flight path all the way to the landing would mean landing at or beyond its touchdown point. A common mistake is to stay above the other airplane's path until the last few hundred feet and forget about the wake turbulence to concentrate on the landing. However, the other airplane produces wake turbulence all the way to touchdown. Make sure to land beyond its touchdown point or go around if you're not comfortable with the situation. If you are departing behind a larger aircraft, you should note its rotation point. It will start generating vortices as soon as its nose wheel comes off the ground. Staying above its flight path means lifting off prior to its rotation point and climbing out so as to remain above its flight path or turning to diverge from its flight path. Wake turbulence moves with the wind. Since it drifts at a few knots along the ground, this means a few knots of crosswind can hold the upwind vortex in place or carry the downwind vortex over to a parallel runway. When landing on a downwind parallel runway, be cautious of wake turbulence from the other runway which could drift over your runway with the wind. If landing with a crosswind of a few knots, be cautious of the upwind vortex which is likely sitting in place right over the runway. Stay above the flight path of the previous arrival and land beyond its touchdown point. A light quartering tailwind is particularly hazardous with regards to wake turbulence since it brings the upwind vortex right down the runway and holds it in place over the runway. Wake turbulence must also be visualized in relation to all operations near larger aircraft, not just when arriving or departing behind one. Maybe another airplane departs or lands via a runway which crosses the runway you'll be landing on or departing from. If that airplane's nose wheel is in the air when it crosses your runway, it just showered that runway intersection with wake turbulence, and that wake turbulence will drift with the wind. If an airplane executes a low approach, missed approach, or a touch and go landing, then the runway they just flew over will have wake turbulence descending on it which drifts with the wind for the next several minutes. Visualize where wake turbulence is, stay above it, avoid it laterally, or wait a few minutes while it dissipates. Wake turbulence can also be encountered en route or in the traffic pattern. Usually a thousand feet below the other airplane is sufficient to avoid wake turbulence. 
Remember to be extra alert if another airplane's vortices might remain in your touchdown area, drift in from another nearby runway, sink into your takeoff or landing path from a crossing runway, sink into your traffic pattern from operations at a nearby airport, or sink into your flight path while en route. Depending on the circumstances, air traffic control may inform you of traffic you are following at a proximity such that wake turbulence will be a factor. Air traffic control will use the phrase, caution, wake turbulence, and advise you of the traffic. Air traffic control is not responsible for your wake turbulence avoidance. The controller will expect you to adjust your flight path as necessary to avoid the wake turbulence while conforming with your air traffic control clearance or instructions. If you are unsure about where the wake turbulence is or you are uncomfortable, don't hesitate to take the appropriate action, such as performing a go-around and reporting to the tower that you were not comfortable with the wake turbulence. Oftentimes, taking a delay of only a few minutes will allow the wake turbulence to dissipate. Pilots of light aircraft also need to be cautious of jet wash, prop wash, and rotor wash. Make sure adequate space exists between aircraft and helicopters you taxi behind or around. For jet airplanes, this distance might be 500 or 1,000 feet. For helicopters, three times the rotor diameter is generally considered to be the extent of its rotor wash. When a helicopter is in forward flight, it generates a trail of rotor wash that behaves similarly to the wingtip vortices of an airplane. 